say welcome to all of you. Thank you for zooming in and for staying in and staying warm. And uh, we're hopefully we'll be back. Those of you that are in will hopefully have church next Sabbath. And then those of you that are still staying in and staying safe, which I don't fault anybody for doing that, by the way, with the COVID as well as the weather, uh, we'll be able to Zoom again next Sabbath too. So before we get into the sermon topic, I've asked Tom if he would lead us in prayer. Tom, would you have our opening prayer, please? Dear Heavenly Father, as we meet today to come together as a church, even though we come together electronically, we're so grateful for the tools made available to us so we can come. And we are looking forward to a message from you to our pastor. We ask a special blessing on the congregation as a whole, even though the weather has been curtailing the efforts to come together face to face. We are so grateful for the people that we have and the blessing that we have in coming as a community together via this tool. We ask a special blessing on those that are under the weather, the people that are suffering from the COVID-19 pandemic. We pray for our leaders so they may find a solution and help us move forward in this. And we ask for your guidance to those leaders as well, because we know without your guidance, not much will happen. We need to trust in you for the message that you have for us and for the guidance in our lives. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tom. So yeah. You can see that the um, title of today's message is entitled A Healing Process. I'm sure that we all know what it's like when you, um, you cross paths with an old friend, someone you haven't seen in years. And after you get through the introductions and just visiting for just a little bit before long the conversation will turn to getting caught up on how other people are doing you've probably had that experience i'm sure there was a time when angie and i were uh, we were driving back to kansas city from northern michigan where her parents live and as we were driving south uh, there in northern michigan angie has the feeling of calling up an old friend her name is amy and she calls amy on the phone and Amy lives down in the Grand Rapids area, further south. And Amy happened to ask Angie, oh, where are you guys? And Angie says, well, we're up in northern Michigan. We're driving back to Kansas City. She said, well, we're at in northern Michigan. She said, oh, we're about a half hour north of, of Grayling. If any of you know where Grayling, Michigan is, that's where the Michigan Conference Youth Camp is, just outside of Grayling, Michigan. And when she said, well, we're just a little bit north of Grayling, I could hear over the phone, I'm driving and Angie's talking on the phone, I could hear Amy scream. Ah, well, she said, well, we are at Camp Asabo. We're just uh, about a half hour south of you. She said, why don't you stop in at Camp Asabo? We can visit for a little bit. So we did. And as we get acquainted with Roy and Amy, there's a picture of them, by the way. This is a time that they went on a backpacking trip with us years ago. As we did, um, you know, before long, we're asking, well, how so-and-so? Oh, well, well, they died. I didn't realize that, didn't know that. How, how, about, how about so-and-so? Oh, well, they're having health problems. They're having a lot of health issues right now. How, how such and such are doing? Well, they're not doing so good. They've got the, the, this issue. And, and on and on it went with things like that. Someone had been in a bad accident. Someone was in bad health. Someone had been having surgery, someone was discouraged, someone has cancer, those kind of things we're getting caught up in. And so when we finally get back on the road and I'm driving down the road, it dawned on me how we all have needs, we all have hurts, we're all damaged goods, and we all need healing in some way, shape, or form in some type of area in our life. It could be physical healing or spiritual healing, yes, but it could also be emotional healing or mental healing. It could also be financial healing or relational healing. But we all have hurts. We all need help. We need healing in some way. Problem is that when we go to Jesus, when we, when we go to God in prayer, sometimes it gets difficult when the help that we're asking for the help or the healing that we're seeking for does not come as quickly 
as we would like for it to come. Today, we're gonna to look at a story that I hope will help us in the area of trusting Jesus when heaven's help does not come as soon as we would like for it to. What we're gonna see in this story from Mark chapter eight is that Jesus didn't always heal somebody immediately. And that's true today. Sometimes he does. There are lots of stories in the Bible where he did heal immediately. But today we're gonna to look at a story where it was not an immediate healing. It was instead a healing process. And it's a story that I think is especially pertinent for us in the last days of earth's history when God says his last day people are characterized by an adjective that fits in with having a clear understanding of God's healing process. And that adjective is the word patience, patient and endurance. Like it says in Revelation 14, here's the patience of the saints. So we need to have this lesson from the story of a healing process clear to help and benefit us at the time that we're living in today, just before the second coming of Jesus. So don't get discouraged if you're not healed immediately. If the help that you're seeking for doesn't come as quickly as you would like it to, if the solutions don't come now, as we look at the lessons of the story of Jesus healing a blind man here in Mark chapter eight, we can know that if we're not healed immediately, we can know that we are then definitely in God's healing process. So to begin with, let's just read the story. It's only four verses long, and it starts in Mark 8, 22. Then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him, and they begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. And he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up and he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Okay, that's the story, just four verses long. But like I said, it's a very important story for God's last day end time people who have the patience of the saints. The story pertaining to a healing process. So let's look at the lesson starting in verse 22. It says that he came to Bethsaida, they brought a blind man to him, and they begged Jesus to touch him. So notice that's that's what they were asking for. They were they, when they said to Jesus, please, we're begging you, please, Jesus, touch him. What were they really asking? They they was not they were not really asking him to just simply touch him. There was more to it when they said, Would you please touch? our blind friend, when the blind man called out, please touch me, Lord, what he was really asking for was, Lord, I believe that when you touch me, you will heal me, and that the healing will come immediately. So when he said that begged him to touch him, he was begging him to heal him, restore his sight, heal him of blindness. Now, surely they had heard at this point in Jesus' career here, surely they had heard other stories of how Jesus had healed blind people. And there were several other stories of how he had healed blind people. For example, Matthew 9, 27 and 28, there's a story of two blind men who were immediately healed. Lord, please touch me too. Like you did in the story in Matthew 9 with the two blind men who were immediately healed. In Matthew 12, verse 22, there was a blind demoniac and he too was immediately healed. In Matthew 15, verse 30, there were blind people and they were immediately healed. In Matthew 20, 30 to 34, it said, so Jesus had compassion, touched their eyes and immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. So when the blind man calls out begging Jesus, Lord, touch me. He was expecting that when Jesus would just simply touch him, he would immediately be healed. So that's the context from which the rest of this story flows. Verse 23, well, he took the blind man by the hand. What did Jesus do here? The man's request was for immediate, immediate healing, to, to be touched and immediately healed. But instead, the man's request was unfulfilled. Jesus did not fulfill 
the request of the man to be immediately healed by a simple touch. Instead, the answer that Jesus gave the man who had just been begging him to touch him and heal him, instead Jesus, is, the answer is no. Instead, he takes him by the hand. He did not do what the man specifically had asked him to do. So, what about me today? What about us today? Are we willing, when Jesus doesn't fulfill our specific requests, are we willing to let Jesus take us by the hand and keep our hand in the hand of Jesus, even when he doesn't do what we're asking him to do? Even if it's not what I'm expecting, will I let Jesus take me by the hand? And will I choose to keep my hand in the hand of Jesus, even when my request is unfulfilled? So it's easy at this point to think or to say, what in the world is going on, Lord? That's not how it's supposed to happen. That's not what I asked for. But you've got me by the hand. I want to keep my hand in the hand of Jesus. Remember that when your specific request isn't fulfilled immediately at the time or in the way that you would expect it to be fulfilled. But the story goes on. This healing process goes on. It says, so he took the blind man by the hand and he led him out of the town. What's going on here? Led him out of the town. Jesus takes this blind man out of his comfort zone. He takes him away from everything that's familiar to him. He went from a request of being unfulfilled to now being placed in an uncertain situation. Unfulfilled request. Now he's in an uncertain situation. He's taken out of the town, out of his comfort zone. If a person is blind and can't see, and I'm just speaking from my own imagination now, if I was to be blind, it would take a little bit of time for me to get familiar with my surroundings. It would take a little bit of time for me to get familiar with the inside of my house on where things are, where the furniture is, and where the different rooms are and the doors, but in time I would be more comfortable figuring out the surroundings that I'm in. And then I could expand my horizons to where I could actually go outside and it would take a little bit more time for me to get familiar and comfortable with my surroundings outside in the town in which I live. And then this blind man, he would be familiar, I'm sure, with how many steps it is to the left outside of his house before he gets to the corner of the street. And then how many more steps to the right before he comes to the marketplace. Inside the, the, the home, inside the town is a comfort zone for a blind person who knows where things are in the surroundings in which he's in. But when you take somebody then outside of that familiarity, out into the wide open spaces outside of town, now he's in an uncertain situation. Now he's in outside of his comfort zone and it's no longer comfortable anymore. So today, it's not what I have, it's not what I asked for, Lord. I didn't ask for you to put your hand, my hand in your hand. I asked you to touch me and heal me. It's not what I expected. Am I still willing to trust? Jesus? Or is this the point in which I feel like I need to jerk my hand out of his hand and run back into my comfort zone? We got to remember that when things don't happen the time and the way in which we expect or ask Jesus to do it, if he doesn't heal us immediately, then we can trust that we are in God's healing process. His request was unfulfilled. He's now in an uncertain situation. He's outside of his comfort zone. What happens next? He's still continuing to trust Jesus to his credit. He hasn't yanked his hand away and run back into the village and back into his home. To his credit, he's still there with Jesus. What happens next? He took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the town, and when he had spit on his eyes. Now this situation spitting on his eyes. It goes from being his request being unfulfilled to an uncertain situation. This is a very unpleasant experience 
that he's going into now. And at this point, does he jerk away? <clears throat> at this point, does he still keep trusting in this awful process that he's going through with Jesus? You know, having someone spit on your eye, spit, spit in your face, it's what it says. I mean, I, I had a hard time finding a picture that I could actually use for this slide. And the only best thing that I could come up with was a cute little baby with drool coming out of his mouth for spit because it's such a, a gross thing. Spitting and spitting in someone's face. Talk about an unpleasant situation. What about us today? What about me? What about you? Is this the point where my faith in Jesus breaks down? Because now my request has been unfulfilled. I'm, in, I'm outside of my comfort zone. It's an uncertain situation, and now it's an unpleasant experience that I'm going through. I don't like this. Is this when I yank my hand away from Jesus and go back to my comfort zone? Is this where I snap and begin taking things out on people that are closest to me? Have you ever done that when, when things get out of sorts, and next thing you know, you're saying things or doing things that only make things worse? The man could have easily thought at this point, Jesus, what are you doing? I do not like this. Things have gone from bad to worse. I mean, I just expected that you would touch me and heal me. Why are, why are these things happening the way they are? We have to come to grips. Are we willing to trust, even if it's an unpleasant situation, even if it's a nasty process that we are going through? But remember, he still got his hand in the hand of Jesus. Jesus still has his hand on this man as he's leading him through this healing process. And Jesus is still doing that with us as well. If we will choose by faith to keep our hand in his hand, we're still going through this healing process with Jesus. What happens next? When he had spit on his eyes, and put his hands on him. Now, the unpleasant situation becomes an uncomfortable situation. I mean, it's one thing to have someone spit in your face, but then to take their hands and rub those heavy hands on your face where the spit ends, I mean, it goes, it gets even more gross gets even more uncomfortable. Now he's experiencing in a very uncomfortable feeling. What kind of process is this that you're taking me through, Jesus? He was just expecting a light touch and to be immediately healed, but his request was unfulfilled. He was in an uncertain place. It was unpleasant, and now it's an uncomfortable feeling. What about me? What about you? What about us today? It's difficult to trust in God's healing process when our feelings turn against us. When our feelings, it's uncomfortable, it's not pleasant, it's uncertain, I'm outside my comfort, comfort zone. It becomes more challenging to trust in God's healing process when we're going through it like this blind man in the story here. You know, feelings can be a very powerful force could this be the possible reason for this story to be in the Bible, for Jesus to want to teach us and remind us that every one of us as Christians need to come to a point where we learn how faith is a force greater than feeling. That's what this process was for the blind man. And it's the same lesson, a very important lesson that Jesus is teaching every one of us in the last days of earth's history. As we continue to trust him through our healing processes, teaching us lessons on how faith in Jesus has got to be greater than the powerful force of feeling. Faith is a more powerful force that Jesus wants us to know, to experience, to learn. And it overpowers all these other uncomfortable things that we go through in our daily lives. 
You've probably heard the story of how the ancient mariners, the cartographers of old, like back in the 1500s, it was 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, but you know, the, the maps of the sailors back then, they didn't really know what was on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. And so some of the maps that they have in those days, what the ancient cartographers would do is to the west of Europe, when they got to the unknown regions of the ocean, they would put things like a giant and they would say, here be giants or scorpions, here be scorpions or here be dragons. They actually have one of these 15, it dates back to 1525. They actually have one of these Mariner maps, Mariner charts in um, the London Museum. But the map that they have that dates back to 1525 fell into the possession of Sir John Franklin, who was a British explorer. In eight, he, he lived in, in the early 1800s. And the map that's now currently in the London Museum belonged to Sir John Franklin. And it was interesting that what Franklin did to the old map that he had where it said, here be dragons, he put this in its place. He X'd it out and he wrote, here be God. When you come to the unknown, where you don't know what else is on the other side, rather than focusing on the dragons, here be God. In the last days of Earth's history, when the great red dragon of Revelation 12 is wrath with the woman and goes to make a war with the remnant of her seed and the fear is real, we got to remember, here be God. When we're going into the unknown and we don't know how in the world are we ever going to get through this. There's no way I'm going to be able to make it out of this. That is at that point in time, Jesus is teaching us now through the healing process that we're going through, how faith is a power greater than fear. And he's teaching us to know, here be God instead. Do you believe that even when you don't feel as though God is answering your prayers? Do you believe that even though you don't know exactly how things are going to turn out, but you're keeping, you're choosing to keep your hand by faith in the hand of Jesus, despite this unpleasant process that you're going through, by faith you're believing that Jesus is still holding on to you and you're keeping your hand in his hand. He's leading you through a healing process. That's why I think this story is so important for us today. Because like I said, God's last day in time people, here's the patience of the saints. Here are the people that hang in there despite the fears, despite the unknown. Going back to the story, Mark 8, the story continues. Jesus asked the man at this point, he's come to this uncomfortable feeling now. I mean, the things have gotten from, gone from bad to worse for this man. And at this point, Jesus asks him if he saw anything. The man, he looked up and he said, yeah, I, I do see something, but it's not very clear. I, I see men like trees walking. He says, yeah, I can see a little something now, but it's so blurry. I mean, it's not clear. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a little better, but it's, it's not good, Lord. I, I see men like trees walking. He must have been unsatisfied with the result at this point. Wouldn't you? I would be. I mean, after everything that he had been through, taken outside of his comfort zone, spit in his face, uncomfortable feeling of his hands being put upon his, his eyes. And he says, okay, now tell me, what do you see? And I would look up and I would expect, okay, it's going to work now. Everything's going to be clear. But how disappointing would it be? No, it's not clear. Not clear at all. It just looks like shadowy figures off in the distance that I see. This would very well be the point where disappointment would sink in and be the greatest at this point. It didn't work. We tried. It didn't work. The effect, the result is unsatisfactory. And being unsatisfied with it would certainly be understandable. So put yourself in this blind man's shoes. How disheartening would that be for you? God does something for you, but he just doesn't do enough. It's just not right. Things just don't work out. Well, at least we try. 
So is this the point that you give up? Is this the point that you lose hope? Is this the point that you jerk your hand out of the hand of Jesus and say, okay, I'm done, I'm going home. I'm sure you're familiar with Corey Ten Boom. She um, lived through World War II, lived through German concentration camp at Ravensbrück. Her sister, Betsy, and her were, uh, were put there. I want you to notice what Corey Ten Boom says, this survivor from the concentration camp. She wrote, often I have heard people say how good God is. We prayed that it would not rain for our church picnic and look at the lovely weather. Yes, God is good when he sends good weather, but God was also good when he allowed my sister Betsy to starve to death before my eyes in a German concentration camp. I remember one occasion when I was very discouraged there. Everything around us was dark and there was darkness in my heart. I remember telling Betsy that I thought God had forsaken us. I can imagine that's how the blind men would feel in the story we're looking at. Betsy speaks up. No, Corey, said Betsy. Betsy, the one who starved to death. Betsy, the one says this before she dies. No, Corey, God has not forgotten us. Remember his word, quote, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. And then Corey closed by saying, there's an ocean of God's love available. There's plenty for everyone. May God grant you never to doubt that victorious love, whatever the circumstances. What a statement of someone who has learned through the awful, sometimes terrible healing processes that we are led through sometimes, but the fact remains, it's still true. There's an ocean of God's love available, plenty for everyone. May God grant you never to doubt the victorious love, whatever the circumstances. Betsy didn't survive the concentration camp, but she clung by faith to the healing process that God was leading her through. And that process for Betsy is not yet done. The good news of faith is that even when things don't work out the way that we would expect, in the end, we are still going to win. In the end, healing will come. And we've got to hold on to that in the healing processes that we go through. That's why I think this story uh, learning how to trust God through the healing process is probably more important than the immediate healing that we expect or we would like to see. Look what happens next, though. In Mark 8, verse 25, at the lowest, most discouraging point for this blind man in the story, then he, Jesus, put his hands on his eyes again. He had put his hands there before, took them away, said, okay, look up. Do you see anything? Yeah, but it's just not good. It's just not clear. And the disappointment was real. Jesus puts his hands on his eyes again, made him look up. And I think that's emphatic. It made him do it. Like Jesus is saying to the man, you cannot give up now. I understand you being discouraged. It didn't, it seems like it didn't work. Stop looking down. I'm sure this blind man, his body language, everything, his head must have been hanging down. He must have been so discouraged. Jesus says, no, stop it. Look up. And here we see something about Jesus. In the midst of our discouragement, Jesus is undaunted. Jesus is not giving up. Jesus has not quit on this process, and neither shall we. And I found some other words that begin with un that could fit here. Jesus is undaunted. Jesus is undeterred. Jesus is unrelenting. Jesus is unstoppable. The blind man may have felt like giving up, but Jesus made him look up and said, no, we're not done yet. Don't give up yet. Now, the man had a choice. 
He could have decided to say no thanks and just walked home with his head hanging down. Or he could respond and do by faith what Jesus told him to do. We've got to learn to trust Jesus every step of this healing process that he's leading us through. He is not going to give up until our healing comes. He will not give up on us until the healing that we're asking for and begging for becomes reality, but it will come. So he made him look up. We all have needs. We all have hurts. We're all damaged goods. This man is struggling. And when Jesus made him look up, look what happens next. Oh, before we get to that next slide, I found this. I, I wanted to share this with you. We're at a point here where when bad things happen to us, crying is acceptable and puking is acceptable. That's okay. We know we, we can do that. Pain is acceptable. Bleeding is acceptable. Falling is acceptable. Crawling, even if we have to, is acceptable. But notice this. Quitting is never acceptable. Quitting isn't acceptable. Jesus is at this point with this blind man where he says, it is not time to quit now. Listen, we're too close to the finish line for any of us to drop out now. We're too close to the finish line for any of us to just give in to the the feelings of discouragement because things didn't work out the way we would like them to work out. We're too close to the finish line to give in to our fears now when Jesus is still undaunted and he's still saying, don't give up now, look up instead. And when he did, he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Amen. There you have it. The story has a happy ending. There you have it. My story, your story, despite our fears, despite the hurts or the healings that we need, and the healing doesn't come, whether it's emotional healing or mental healing or physical healing or relational healing, it will come. He was restored and saw everyone clearly. Don't be discouraged. Don't give up. The feelings are real, but your hand is still by faith in the hand of Jesus. Rest in the assurance, rest in the confidence that God's miraculous healing will come as long as we keep trusting him through a healing process. Jesus is always undefeated. He is undaunted. He is always undefeated. He will never lose. Oh, it may appear as though we're on the losing side sometimes, but Jesus is always undefeated. We've got to remember that it's the winning side. Keep trusting him through his healing process. Calvin Coolidge, 30th president of the United States, said this about the importance of hanging in there, the importance of persevering, the importance of endurance. He wrote, he said, nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Talent cannot. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius, genius cannot. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education cannot. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination will always win out in the end. Do you believe that? Do you believe that especially when it applies to Jesus? Do you believe that with with the description of God's last day people who go through a period called the Great Tribulation. It says in Daniel 12, greater than any tribulation that there has ever been from the beginning of time, but God will have a people who are still trusting in his healing process, no matter how bad they may feel. We can press on in faith especially when we're feeling unfulfilled, especially when we're feeling uncertain, unpleasant, uncomfortable, unsatisfied, because Jesus is always undaunted and he is always undefeated. And by faith, we will trust him. Despite all the other unpleasantries, we will trust him till he leads us to that ultimate victory in the end. Revelation 17 says there's going to come a time when 
The people will side with the beast, and they will make war against the lamb. But the lamb will overcome them. The lamb will be victorious, and those who are with him. That's us. Those who are with the lamb. Those who have not jerked their hand out of the hand of Jesus as he's led them through this healing process. Those that are with him, they are called. They are chosen. They are faithful. We've already been called. We've already been chosen. Let's be faithful. And let's know without a doubt that the victory of the Lamb is our victory. Like it says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57, Thanks be to God, which gives us his victory. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that the discouraging things that come our way are not the ultimate end. Thank you that the unpleasantries and the uncertainties, the unfulfilled requests that we sometimes make will ultimately in the end be victorious because you've taken us by the hand and we're keeping our hand by faith in the hand of Jesus. Thank you that you are undaunted, Jesus. You don't give up on us. Thank you that you are, are victorious. You are undefeated. And thank you for giving us your victory despite our weakness, despite our fears, despite our feelings, that you know how to encourage us and to say, look up, make us look up like you did the blind man when you made him look up at that point in his life. Thank you for reminding us of that today, to look up, for our redemption is drawing nigh. Thank you for your encouragement. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.